Theology, the judge of all human knowledge. I appreciate how grandiose the title sounds. I believe I suggested it, but in any case, it is extremely appropriate uh, for this topic, for this, for this talk. But it's also really not that surprising that theology should be in this position of judging all human knowledge. Theology is the understanding of faith. And the idea that faith is greater than any purely human knowledge is really simple boilerplate for the Christian. Now, perhaps saying that theology judges all human knowledge raises the specter of Christians re rejecting evolution or the idea that the earth moves because these ideas are contrary to what, quote, the Bible says, end quote. But even so, the idea of the superiority of the faith is commonplace. What God has revealed to us about his inner life, about the mystery of creation, the unfathomable love displayed in the incarnation, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the mystery of the sacraments, and the fact that our ultimate destiny is eternal loving communion with God. These things simply are greater than anything we could discover on our own power, no matter what tremendous intellectual uh, prowess is brought uh, um, to the task. But the relationship of theology and other forms of knowledge uh, includes two other claims that I think are shared by almost all Christians. They're certainly at the heart of the Thomistic understanding. One is the autonomy, the proper autonomy of different fields of human knowledge. So any field of study, from the physical sciences to the study of the human person to the most refined speculations of metaphysics has its own proper principles and methods. Or to put it another way, we know the science of psychology not by being Christian, but by studying psychology. The other idea is the unity of truth. The God who created the world is the same God who has given us revelation. And so there can be no contradiction between a truth known in the order of creation, gained by natural reason, and a truth known through faith and divine revelation. If there seems to be a contradiction between these things, we may be confident that it's an on only a seeming contradiction, it's not a real one, and that further refinement and study will harmonize the properly corrected truth claims. Now, Thomas Aquinas, near the beginning of his Summa Theologiae, has a text directly on this point. And it's famous uh, among Thomists. It comes from the first question of the Summa, Article 6. The article uh, asks whether sacra doctrina is the same as wisdom. And there is an objection that asserts that it pertains to wisdom to prove the principles of other sciences, but sacra doctrina does not do this, and therefore it's not the same as wisdom. So if I could have our first slide uh, posted, please. The passage in which Aquinas responds to this reads as follows. Quote, the principles of other sciences either are evident and cannot be proved or are proved by natural reason through some other science. But the knowledge proper to this science comes through revelation and not through natural reason. Therefore, it has no concern to prove the principles of other sciences, but only to judge of them. Whatsoever is found in other sciences contrary to any truth of this science must be condemned as false destroying counsels in every height that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. I want to give, uh, uh, to say, say a couple of bit, uh, see, a couple things about a general uh, interpretation of this passage before we go into some uh, details. First of all, Aquinas is referring to sciences. And clearly, he doesn't have in mind here modern empirical sciences, but science in the Aristotelian sense. That is a body of knowledge uh, that reasons from clear and certain first principles to conclusions. Any field of human knowledge that can be described in this way can rightly be called a science. Geometry is sort of the classic example of this, beginning with first principles reasoning to conclusions. Physics and metaphysics are likewise sciences. So are human sciences, like psychology or political science. If you can say, this is how various human societies are organized, these are some universal principles that apply to all of them, and we can draw conclusions about how they work, 
you have a political science. Now, slide two, please. Aquinas is referring in this passage to this science. This science is what I already said is sacra doctrina, which is variously translated as sacred doctrine, holy teaching, or even theology. It's a science because it begins with principles that are the things revealed by God and reasons from them to theological conclusions. For example, we believe that Jesus Christ is true God and true man. That is a first principle we know from Revelation. We then try to understand this by reasoning. How can one person have both a divine nature and a human nature without the two being blended or in conflict with one another? Right? That's the science of Sacra Doctrina. I'm going to continue to refer to this as Sacra Doctrina uh, because it's a comprehensive term. It includes both what's given to us by faith and the theology that stems from that. So this comes from Revelation, whereas other sciences, he says, come from natural reason. This is not a, a mark against the other sciences, but Sacra Doctrina, which is based on God's revelation, uh, is greater than them. Because of this, it can judge these other sciences. Final general point here. Here we could have slide three, please. Aquinas refers to Sacra Doctrina judging, not proving. It has no concern to prove the principles of other sciences, but only to judge of them. This is an implicit reference to the Aristotelian idea of subalternation. If you have two sciences and one is higher than the other, and the conclusions of the higher science provide the principles that the lower science uses, you have what's called subalternation. Okay. The great example that Aquinas will use in several uh, passages is the relationship between arithmetic and music. Arithmetic, the person who knows arithmetic, knows things about number ratios. Okay? What he knows about that become the principles of music, because music, in Aquinas' day, was understood that has to, has to do with consonants and with dissonance. And consonants and dissonance are able to be expressed in numerical ratios. If you have two strings under the same tension and you pluck one and you pluck the other and the other is half as long as the first one, they will sound almost perfectly consonant. The ratio of lengths is two to one and they sound an octave apart. If the ratio of the length of the strings is three to two, you pluck them, they'll sound a fifth apart. Again, the, the uh, consonants has to do with the numerical ratio. So the musician doesn't need to know arithmetic, but what the arithmetician knows become principles for the musician. Aquinas applies this to uh, Sacra Doctrina as a subalternated, as a lower science, when he says that it takes its principles from what he calls the knowledge of God and the blessed. So what we accept in faith is seen directly by God and by the saints with him in heaven. That God knows that he is a trinity. The blessed see that God is a trinity. We receive that knowledge, we believe it, we accept it as a first principle, so our sacra doctrina is subalternated to that higher science. All right, this is an important point. Although sacra doctrina is higher than any other human science, it does not provide the principles to any of them. It does not subalternate any other science. Sacra Doctrina is higher than philosophy, but it doesn't give philosophy its principles. It's higher than political science, but it does not give political science its principles. It doesn't prove them. It judges them. And we'll explore what that means. Okay, my purpose in, in this presentation tonight is to present three per interpretations of this passage from Aquinas that are true as far as they go, but are insufficient. And then I'm going to offer my own uh, interpretation. And I hope that what I say will provoke some comments and questions that will help us to unpack what this looks like in practice. Okay, the first insufficient uh, interpretation is essentially that the claims of or what we know in Sacra Doctrina trumps other truth claims. Slide four, please. This is probably the most common interpretation of this passage, and it focuses on the last sentence. What, whatsoever is found in other sciences, contrary to any truth of this science, 
must be condemned as false. In other words, there are things that the Christian can judge to be false simply because they contradict something that's known in faith. In Aquinas' day, a great example of this was the question of the eternity of the world. Someone who follows Aristotelian natural philosophy will conclude that the universe is eternal. But the Christian knows this is not the case. The Christian knows that the universe is created, that God is eternal, but that the universe was created in time. It had a beginning. For Aquinas, the Christian is certainly right and therefore can claim that any philosophy that insists that the universe is eternal is wrong. A very uh, uh, obvious instance of this that we find more commonly adduced in our day has to do with uh, the permissibility or rather the impermissibility of abortion or euthanasia. The Christian judges these to be wrong simply because they are violations of the commandment thou shalt not murder. If philosophical ethics or political science or any other science claims that abortion or euthanasia are morally acceptable, the Christian can legitimately declare that that science, as so construed, is wrong. Right. Now, Aquinas thinks, certainly thinks, that one can make these judgments. And he says as much in various other passages. But I think as an interpretation of the passage we're looking at, it's insufficient. Slide five, please. Just a reminder, this passage is talking about a science. A science requires intellectual work. It's a process of reasoning from principles to conclusions. And what I've just described as examples of judging another science don't, doesn't really require intellectual work. All it requires is that we say, here's a truth claim that Sacra Doctrina makes, here's a truth claim that another science makes, and you know, say, okay, the one that Sacra Doctrina makes must be true and the other one false, if there's a conflict between them. Um, that, again, that, that's fine, but it doesn't require any real thinking through of Sacra Doctrina. A second reason that I think it's in, uh, insufficient is that the kinds of examples I'm talking about concern conclusions, right? Uh, but Aquinas in this passage is talking about judgment concerning principles. Natural philosophy doesn't regard the eternity of the universe as a principle, but as a conclusion. Philosophical ethics doesn't take the permissibility of euthanasia as a principle, but reasons to it as a conclusion. It seems to me this reveals a very startling thing about what Aquinas is claiming here. A science takes its character from its principles, for they are its foundation. We expect that the practitioners of a given science will argue with one another, sometimes ad nauseum, about what are the proper conclusions within that science, but they're supposed to agree on its foundation, on its nature, its principles. Okay. Sacra Doctrina does not prove the principles of other sciences. They, they are not derivative from it, but it can judge of them, which means it belongs to Sacra Doctrina to judge the very nature of other sciences. Put it this way, it's one thing for me as a theologian to say to a philosopher, well, you may be an expert in philosophy, but if you say X, I will tell you that that can't be right because X contradicts something that belongs to the faith. It's quite another thing for me as a theologian to say, I'm going to tell you what philosophy is. I'm going to make judgments about the very principles of philosophy. A third reason I think that this interpretation is insufficient <clears throat> is that examples of this kind of argument are typically reducible to what is known by faith you know, clear and certain knowledge in faith rather than by the full range of Sacra Doctrina. So it's made on the basis of something that we just know absolutely we, we believe this rather than something that's concluded as the work of theology. A current lively example of this has to do with whether it's ethical to use a vaccine that required at some point in its development the use of cell lines that were derived from a decades old abortion. Now we can know as a principle from Sacra Doctrina that abortion is intrinsically evil. We can also know as a principle 
that one can never commit an act that is intrinsically evil, no matter what good may come out of it. This does not, however, give us sufficient grounds to judge this ethical question, because what we need to understand is the relationship between that decades-old act of abortion and the present act of developing a vaccine or receiving a vaccine. Now, I don't mean to suggest that it's a difficult question. As a matter of fact, I think it's relatively simple, and quite a number of Catholic ethicists have pointed this out. But the point is that one has to appeal to more than just the clear principles of Sacra Doctrina. One has to think through the moral theological conclusions that follow from them. Okay. Aquinas is saying that judgment belongs to Sacra Doctrina, not just the principles of, of Sacra Doctrina, that is the articles of faith, insofar as we can show that some theological conclusion properly flows from what God has revealed, we are justified in making a judgment about the claims of another science on that basis. Now, that judgment may be uh, clearer and more certain if we're appealing to something that's directly revealed by God, but it also, we can also have the same phenomenon of judging on the basis of theological conclusions. It's still warranted to do that. Okay, I want to move on to a second interpretation of this passage. This was suggested by Pope John Paul II in his encyclical Fides et Ratio, and uh, it's really offered as a possible resolution to the Christian philosophy debate of the 20th century. Slide six, please. Although the Christian, just as a Christian, can make no claims to expertise in any particular science, his knowledge of truth in faith can, in some instances, allow him to judge between competing claims regarding the principles of a science. Okay. So being a Christian doesn't mean that I <clears throat> know what, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> what um, biology or, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> what biology or philosophy or political science or whatever say, but in some cases, what I know can shed light upon um, uh, the um, disputed questions in uh, one of these other sciences. For example, in early Christianity, there was a clear preference for Platonic philosophy over other forms of Greek philosophy. In fact, some Christians saw such harmony between Plato and biblical revelation that the idea grew up that Plato had actually studied the Bible under Jewish thinkers uh, in Egypt. Right. Uh, more recently, again turning to John Paul II and Fides et Ratio, this is the way he puts it. Uh, this is from, uh, if you're interested, paragraph 76 of that encyclical. Quote, the term Christian philosophy indicates a Christian way of philosophizing, a philosophical speculation conceived in dynamic union with faith. It does not refer simply to a philosophy developed by Christian philosophers who have striven in their research not to contradict the faith. The term Christian philosophy, this is the key part, the term Christian philosophy includes those important developments of philosophical thinking which would not have happened without the direct or indirect contribution of Christian faith. End quote. The Pope goes on to give some examples of this. For example, philosophy can know in its own right that we are contingent creatures. We don't explain our own existence. Our existence requires a cause. So philosophy without faith can postulate that there must be a first cause. Now, the Christian knows that we are created by God, a free and personal God. And that's who that first cause is, that God is free. He did not have to create us. He is personal. He's not an impersonal first cause. He is personal. That is going to affect what the, the, the philosopher who knows that has more insight into the character of this uh, cause of being that he's talking about. Or again, philosophy has to deal with the problem of evil. What is it? Why does it exist? The Christian knows the reality of sin and understands it in the light of faith. This can affect our very philosophical understanding of evil, something that we would not expect if we did, 
did not have revelation, we did not have faith. Or again, the Christian knows that the person is a spiritual being and therefore will say things about uh, human dignity, equality, and freedom. We saw plenty of examples in the 20th century of uh, uh, non-Christian understandings, non-religious understandings of the human person where uh, the person is simply um, um, uh, uh, a tool of the state, right? just an, uh, an individual who can, under the control of the state. Now, whatever you want to say about the relationship of the individual and the state, you have to say as a Christian, the person is a free spiritual being and therefore cannot simply be regarded as you know, a, a, a tool, something like that. All right, I've given some examples of philosophy. This applies to other sciences as well. I want to mention two. First of all, psychology. Think about behaviorism. Behaviorism may have useful things to teach about human action and how to condition the person to act in good ways. But insofar as it's based on the principle that the spiritual soul is not relevant to human well-being, that human beings are sufficiently understood in terms of bodily-based responses to stimuli, the Christian has every right to judge that it is faulty, that it does not express the whole truth of the person. So it doesn't tell you what is the correct psychological theory, but it tells you that this one is deficient. Uh, and so gives way to some uh, other version uh, of psychology that would give more, um, do more justice to that quality of the person. Or think of evolution. Is evolution the result of blind chance or natural selection or intelligent design? Christians can be favorably inclined to theories of intelligent design because they have an obvious coherence with what the faith knows of God as creator and as providence. Right. Now, one thing you can say about this way of understanding our passage is it does give a good deal of autonomy to the lower science. The Sacra Doctrina does not tell the lower science, you know, uh, um, uh, does not make one an expert in the lower science. Uh, and it also uh, focuses on the fact that we're judging principles. We're sort of uh, talking about things that are intrinsic to the very nature of these sciences. It's insufficient, though, in this respect. I find that judgments of this sort may be, as in the former case, too much of a simple transposition of something known in faith to the field of a lower science. In other words, the judgment is made without a thorough thinking through of Sacra Doctrina. Take the case, again, of early Christianity and its approbation of Platonic philosophy. This gave way throughout the Middle Ages to an approbation of Aristotelian philosophy. And then in the 19th century, when Enlightenment thinkers like Kant and Hegel pro um, proposed very revolutionary uh, philosophical thought, there were Catholic thinkers who said, we have to engage with that. We're not simply going to be Aristotelians. We're going to think through these things in light of Kant and Hegel. And they came up with uh, different philosophical systems. Ex exactly what determination the faith can make regarding competing philosophical proposals is not a simple question. Furthermore, just very briefly, on the uh, question of evolution and intelligent design, uh, these theories can appeal to the person of faith, especially one who is aware that you know, Darwinian uh, uh, theories of evolution have in, uh, inspired uh, attacks on Christianity in the past 150 years. But more than a few Thomistic scholars have argued that the doctrines of creation and providence are misunderstood in intelligent design theory. Okay. Just point out that fact. Again, it's, it's not an easy thing to make this judgment. A third interpretation of our passage, an insufficient interpretation, has to do with Sacra Doctrina as what I'll call an architectonic science. What do I mean? Okay. Bruce Marshall gives a helpful description of this in terms of uh, a comparison with um, two other sciences, stone cutting and architecture. This is what he says, quote, stone cutting has its own goals and methods which the architect is normally willing to leave to the mason. But if the architect's well-designed edifice crumbles because the stones would not bear the load, he rightly judges that the mason, whatever his protest that the stones were flawless, 
needs to produce a different result. The architect may indeed help him figure out how." End quote. Or Aquinas offers this um, uh, uh, explanation of the same thing. It actually occurs in the very uh, article before the one we're looking at, where he says, of the practical sciences, that one is nobler which is ordained to a further purpose, as political silence, science is nobler than military science, for the good of the army is directed to the good of the state." End quote. So, a general may know military science, and thus how to win a war. But the statesman, who knows political science, knows what the war is for, and this may affect how the general goes about prosecuting that war. Similarly, the theologian can judge certain lower sciences because it possesses a greater finality and therefore a greater knowledge of their end. Could we have slide, slide seven, please? Okay. Greater knowledge of the end of the other sciences. For example, the statesman may think that the goal of his activity is the continuation of the state, but the theologian knows that the continuation of the state is subordinate to the ultimate human good, which is loving communion with God. Now, again, this theory, this explanation does a good job of assuring the autonomy of the lower science. The architect is not claiming that he knows what the mason knows. The statesman is not claiming that he knows what the general knows. When we're dealing with practical sciences, the purpose of this science is to lead to this science. Okay? It is for something else. This is a very helpful explanation. And so insofar as theology uh, judges practical sciences, this is a, a useful way of understanding it. It doesn't say anything, though, about the relationship of theology and speculative sciences. What does it mean for theology to judge metaphysics or mathematics or microbiology? We can't explain it in this way. And I could go into this further, but there is no indication in our text that Aquinas is restricting what he's saying to theology in comparison to practical sciences. He really seems to be including speculative sciences as well. Let me give a little summary of what we've accomplished so far. To know Sacra Doctrina is not to know any other science. One becomes a psychologist by studying psychology. One becomes an economist by studying economics. One becomes a microbiologist by studying microbiology. Nevertheless, Sacra Doctrina stands above other sciences and can make judgments about their claims, not only their conclusions, but even their principles. And the person who is best suited to engage in this judgment is not the person of simple faith, who grasps you know, uh, what God has revealed, who, who sees those principles, but the person who has thought deeply about the ramifications of the faith, the theologian, the one who's done the work of theology. So the situation we're trying to envisage here is one in which both Sacra Doctrina and another science are given their due, and in which Sacra Doctrina has a decisive influence on the very structure of the other science, without that science deriving its principles from Sacra Doctrina. I'm going to suggest that a general way to formulate this is that the theologian judges another science by seeing how what he knows in theology illuminates the very thing the other science is talking about. But just as that takes theological work, really considering the manifold implications of revelation for this subject, it also takes work within that other science, really considering the nature of that subject within the whole science. The person making the judgment needs to know the other science from the inside. He needs to be practiced in thinking about it as a science. The person making the judgment needs to be able to think through the science of Sacra Doctrina and the other lower science. So really, he needs to be both a theologian and a practitioner of that lower science. I'm going to give three examples of what it might mean to think through this, to think through what is proper to a science in its own right and the ramifications of the faith. 
But I have to begin with a caveat. If I'm correct in this interpretation of Aquinas, what you need is knowledge of sacra doctrina and knowledge of another science. Now, as a theologian, I have some expertise in the former. But unless I have a thoroughgoing knowledge of another science, unless I have mastery of that science, I'm really hampered in my ability to come to meaningful judgments about its principles. The three examples I, I'm going to give pertain to psychology, political science, and evolutionary biology. I am neither a psychologist, nor a political scientist, nor an evolutionary biologist. And therefore, my conclusions about the principles of these sciences are only tentative. But they may be suggestive. So first of all, psychology. We know in Sacra Doctrina the perfection of the humanity of Jesus Christ. That that humanity is suffused with the grace of union is a dogmatic fact. But what that implies about the knowledge, the virtues, and the passions of Christ is the work of theological reasoning. Now the lower science of human psychology overlaps with Christology. So psychology is, for example, keenly interested in the passions of the soul. And Sacra Doctrina has things to say about the passions of the perfect humanity that is the soul of Christ. This does not mean that one becomes a psychologist by thinking about the humanity of Christ. The principles of psychology are surely learned by observation and induction, by a broader knowledge of the human constitution and such things. But what I'm suggesting is that in considering the humanity of Christ, the theologian has a guide to help him consider the very parameters of human psychology, its basic principles. We can in fact expect an interplay between the claims of these two sciences. The person who understands the faith and understands psychology is best able to give the most adequate formulation of psychology. And this in turn can be used by the theologian to come to an even better understanding of the human soul of Christ, or the soul of another person as it is suffused with grace. Second, political science. It is certainly not the case that the Christian, simply as Christian, knows and understands the principles of the science of politics. But the Christian does have a knowledge of the human good that comes to him from revelation, and if he reflects on it theologically, he will come to have a sense of its ramifications for the political good. For example, the Christian knows St. Paul's idea, maintained ever since by the church, that all authority, even the authority of the secular state, comes from God. Does that mean that the state ought, ideally, to be confessionally Christian? Or is the modern pluralistic model more appropriate? That's not an easy matter to discern. It's not obvious that the Christian must hold for the former option, as one might expect from a simple transposition. That we know that authority comes from God. Well, clearly then the state uh, must understand itself as having its authority from God. Certainly this Christian will hold that the political, political good is less final than the transcendent good of the human being. But he will have to think deeply about what God wants for the political order as well as what the natural laws of human community allow to be possible or impossible, desirable or undesirable. Finally, evolutionary biology. There are no doubt Christians who will argue that any biological theory that asserts that there are multiple origins to the human race, known as polygenism, these must be false because it conflicts with the biblical story of Adam and Eve, or the monogenism that there's a single origin for the human species. This would be the simple transposition of something known through revelation into another science. Now, it's noteworthy that Pope Pius XII, who dealt with this very question in his encyclical Humani Generis in 1950, did not take this approach. To be sure, he attacked the biological theory of polygenism, but his chief argument was, quote, it is in no way apparent how such an opinion can be reconciled with that which the sources of revealed truth and the documents of the teaching authority of the church proposed with regard to original sin." End quote. The Pope implicitly acknowledged that biology has no concern with the literal historical veracity of the biblical account of creation. 
Instead, he said that there is something that we know as part of Sacra Doctrina, namely the truth of original sin that does govern what we can say in biology and will properly affect our approbation or disapprobation of proposed biological theories. Dogmatically, we can say that death came into the world through sin, that its effect was not only on Adam, but on all his posterity, and that this effect is not simply a matter of imitation. In the words of the Council of Trent, it has been, quote, transfused into all, end quote. Theologically, one might go further. The Thomist will, for example, insist theologically that when we say that original sin persists today, we are not talking about actual sin the phenomenological fact that all of us commit personal sins and that these have a profound deleterious effect on our world, but about the sin of Adam that establishes for us the condition into which we come into the world. Original sin exists today because whatever exactly the sin of Adam was and however exactly its effects are passed on to us, we come into the world with a wounded nature. Furthermore, the Thomist will say, that the wound of that nature, as it pertains to death, is not the loss of a natural immortality, but rather the loss of the preternatural gift of freedom from death. In other words, the Thomist does not think that um, Adam and Eve would naturally not have died if they had not sinned. He thinks that if they would not have died, that would have been a special grace from God, what call, the Thomist calls a preternatural gift. Okay. These are things that are pertinent to evolutionary biology. For example, the biologist considers death and decay as natural qualities of composite beings, and the Thomist does not disagree. Perhaps Adam and Eve and their descendants would never have died if they had not sinned. But this could only have been a supernatural gift, which is, of course, beyond the reckoning of the biologist. But the Thomist and the biologist can have a mutually informative conversation about how the propagation of a nature is connected to the biological processes of generation and the development of a species. I'm going to close with a bit of a summary. We are to imagine this judgment regarding, say, philosophy as a lower science, as the work of one single person who is both a theologian and a philosopher, or perhaps as the joint effort of a group of people, some of whom are theologians and some others of whom are philosophers. The theologians cannot just preach to the philosophers. They must be receptive to the truly philosophical work of the philosophers, but raise questions and offer insights that come from their theology, the consideration of which may allow the philosophers to reformulate and refine their philosophy. Snap judgments. The immediate and decisive judgment about a truth claim made by the philosophers on the basis of some clear and obvious principle of faith are not what are called for here. Instead, we may expect a lengthy, deliberative process driven by an ever-deepening understanding of revelation and requiring real insight into the practice of philosophy. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, Professor Lenabe. Um, to start our Q&A, could, um, for, and, and for those who joined uh, the lecture a little bit late, um, would you mind refer returning to um, uh, defining um, Sacra Doctrina? Is it, is it simply a, um, is it a synonym, synonym of theology? Or? Not, okay, not exactly. It depends on how you understand theology. But typically the, the term theology refers to the, we take it as referring to the activity of academic theologians, right? Um, it's the reasoning, it's um, the thing, that sort of thing that we study. Sacra Doctrina is everything from simply receiving the truth revealed by God to thinking about its ramifications. So Sacra Doctrina involves the simple faith of the believer and the activity of the theologian drawing conclusions from that. Now you can use the word theology to encompass all of that as well, but typically it's not used that way. So to highlight that fact, that's why I, I'm just continuing to talk about Sacra Doctrina. Great, thank you. All right, um, Joey Diaz from YouTube asks, what is the role of theology in the guiding of lower sciences in our current day? Specifically, is there room to limit or expand the study of a lower science based on findings in theology? 
Well, uh, in principle, um, our situation today is no different from any other era of human history. Uh, any other science um, can be uh, informed by Sacra Doctrina. So uh, there's nothing distinctive about our situation today. Um, if you're asking for particular examples of how I think this might uh, happen, I think, uh, let me put it this way. There can be a tendency, and this is something we saw in the Thomistic world sort of throughout the 20th century, there can be a tendency to give such weight to the autonomy of philosophy that theology uh, seems to be a, a very, very separate discipline and it not um, really able to encroach upon philosophy at all. So if you import anything you know in theology, you're all of a sudden doing theology, you're no longer doing philosophy. So in a way that was a very sensible thing to do because what philosophy recognizes is that things have natures and we have to understand them in light of those natures. If we want to have political science, we really need to know what are the laws that govern human community? I don't talk, talk about the man-made laws, I'm talking about the natural laws that govern human community. So what's the nature of the political community? What can we say about that? But having said that, can theology uh, expand our understanding? P possibly, because it could uh, manifest something about human community that we wouldn't get just by looking at the nature of that community. Uh, there, was, uh, there were a number of people some years ago who um, wanted to talk a good deal about uh, uh, political discourse and the civilization of love. And I think to uh, a number of uh, philosophers or political scientists, that sounded like an imposition, like, uh, um, can we really describe political society in terms of a civilization of love? That, I mean, that sounds great, but it doesn't seem to really be paying attention to what the political community is. But I don't think it was a kind of pie in the sky idealism on the part of these people. They were saying that really God reveals to us something about the nature of human community. Perhaps that is through the church, through the extraordinary uh, reality of a single body of Christ that is uh, created by the gift of grace, that, that is what the church is. Maybe that can teach us something about the very nature of human community. But you can't get around the hard work of thinking through the nature of political community as well. I think I'll leave it at that. Great, yes. thank you. Uh, Joe from YouTube, Joe, Joe uh, Moynihan from YouTube asks, can Dr. Lenave speak of this talk's conclusion in relation to a robust interpretation of dignitatis humanae, as well as to ecumenism and interreligious dialogue? Um, the way I understand that question, and I would invite Joe to um, send in a further comment if I'm not getting this right. But the examples I give of ecumenism, interreligious dialogue, and dignitatis humanae suggest to me that, okay, what all of those endeavors or documents um, are, are based on is a recognition of the truth that is in the other, and that we, though we claim a full knowledge of the truth, need to be hesitant about imposing that upon others. Right? So when the Catholic engages in ecumenism, dialogue with other Christians. The Catholic does not have to bracket what he knows in the faith. He doesn't have to bracket his Catholicism. But he also, it's not a very interesting conversation if he is simply telling the other Christians, okay, you need to believe in the real presence of the body, uh, blood of Christ in the Eucharist. You need to believe in the authority of the Pope. You need to believe in this and this and this, okay? He doesn't have to doubt any of those things. He doesn't have to put them in question. But it's not a dialogue if he is simply telling people these things, right? So ecumenism demands uh, a desire to learn from the other, to take on the perspective of the other. What are they seeing about this truth? And is this something that I can um, uh, use to enrich uh, what I see as well? 
Okay? Likewise, with dignitatis humanae, the idea that we're not going to impose the faith upon anyone because it, really because uh, the decision of faith is something that requires the freedom of the person, right? Uh, again, it doesn't mean that we have to be um, dubious about the fact that we know the truth. You know, if we know that God exists and that Jesus Christ is true God and true man and he died for our sins and so on, we want to propose this people as strongly as possible. But do we want to force them to believe that as well? No, we don't because um, the, uh, it, it's not a matter of, um, it's not a matter of acting as if their denial of those things is true. It's a matter of recognizing that for this to be at all salutary for them, they have to freely come to believe it. So we can propose it, but we can't impose it. Um, similarly with interreligious dialogue, okay, as again, a matter of we proclaim the gospel, but we are also interested in uh, seeing what there could be in other um, uh, uh, religions, right, that would enrich what we uh, have to say. And, and actually, this is an interesting one. Uh, in interreligious dialogue, I think there's a principle here that it's possible that in that dialogue, we will find resources in the way that other people uh, understand the natures of things or the, uh, the, the world of creation, we will find resources there that are actually superior to the philosophical resources that we have used to understand the faith. You know, sort of in principle, and I'm not saying whether this is the case or not, but in principle, let's say uh, Indian ph uh, philosophy may on some point or other have a more incisive, uh, helpful understanding of the world than Aristotelian philosophy. It's in principle, that could be true. And if that's the case, then we definitely want, what this talk is suggesting is that, oh, we want to learn from that. We want to think through things in light of that philosophy so as to uh, come to a better understanding of Sacra Doctrina. But we're also going to judge it in light of Sacra Doctrina. Okay. Uh, it's a question that's, that's kind of related uh, to what you just uh, said. So uh, with regard to the, um, the philosophical tools by which we understand the faith, mm -hmm. um, someone asks, can someone not be Aristotelian or Platonist and still be Catholic, even broadly speaking? In principle, yes, in the sense that I just described, in that in principle, uh, you can, there, there could be a philosophical system that is even greater than Platonism or Aristotelianism, right? Uh, but there are things that the church has come to understand either dependent upon Platonic philosophy or an Aristotelian philosophy that are uh, essential, that are core. And so what we would not expect is that, oh, no, we were wrong about those things, right? And so set them aside in favor of something else, but rather that, oh, we were right about those things, but here's a philosophical system that takes those and even goes beyond them, right? So I would say in principle, that is the case. However, I think there's also something to be said uh, for the idea of the providential appearance uh, work of philosophy uh, in history. So there's no, I don't think it's an accident that uh, the church uh, started thinking about the faith in light of these philosophies. There's something essentially true about them. So I think typically what you're going to find is that um, I, I think, uh, uh, G.K. Chesterton puts it this way in his book on Aquinas. He said, Aquinas realized um, that when uh, Christ rose from the dead, Aristotle would rise as well. If you just give that line to somebody, it seems a little bit shocking. But what he's saying is that there are certain true things in Aristotelian philosophy, things that are perfectly coherent with what we know in the faith, and therefore we will, we will always know these things to be true. Um, and that was Clay McDermott from YouTube who asked that question. Our next question comes from Marilyn on Zoom. Um, she asks, asks if you can uh, clarify what you said about uh, psychology and Jesus Christ. 
She asks, uh, do you mean that studying Christ as the perfectly psychologically healthy human being would serve to improve the science of psychology? I do mean that. Um, I don't know exactly what that would look like. Um, and I don't have a deep knowledge of psychology, but uh, I would suggest this. This is an example that I've used from time to time. There are uh, schools of psychology that would say that it's healthy for uh, a child in the process of development, particularly in, in, in becoming an adult, to rebel, uh, to uh, set himself apart from his parents because that differentiation needs to happen in order for him to become mature. Right? A child who never rebels, who is simply uh, echoing his parents, simply following them, um, you know, may seem to be a very functioning adult person, but the, the necessary differentiation, the natural maturation hasn't happened. Okay, that's uh, something a psychologist might say. It seems to me that if you impose that into uh, the understanding of the faith, you're left with a situation in which there's got to be some opposition between the will of the human will of Christ and his divine will, or between the will of Christ and the will of the Father. And that <laughs> the theologian is going to look at with puzzlement uh, or, or simply reject because it is uh, not a particularly healthy thought. Right? What we know is that there is perfect harmony between the divine will and the human will in Christ. They're different, but they are perfectly harmonized. Now, does that mean that the only healthy human being is one that mimics that perfect harmony? I wouldn't say that, but I think it, it changes our view of that point about maturation through differentiation. I think it's an essential thing to consider in looking at that. I don't know how helpful that example is, but I th do think it speaks to the point. Paul, Paul from Zoom asks, uh, well, he says that we accept as a fact that we have different paradigms and sciences, and there are multiple competing philosophical systems. How many theologies could be out there? Is there a competition of theories, ideas in such a science? Could we imagine uh, progress in such a science? Um, so maybe a, a, you know a way of, of you know distilling this question is there is there one right way of doing theology and is that Thomism? Yes. <laughs> okay. Now a serious answer to that is that um, uh, what do I want to say about that? I would say as a Catholic. Uh, I'm aware that the church has raised up certain theological thinkers to extraordinary heights. It said, these people are just supremely valuable for understanding the faith. That doesn't mean that everything they said is true, but everyone can, can read uh, and follow these people uh, fruitfully. You know, it, point, it, it, it identifies various doctors of the church. And among those are some who were definitely engaged in the science of theology. Uh, from my uh, um, uh, reading of theology, I'd say that, uh, and I don't think there's real dispute about this, there are two or three figures in the theological tradition that stand above the others. Thomas Aquinas, Augustine, and possibly Bonaventure is a third. Now, my specialty is in Bonaventure, so that's an interesting um, conversation about whether he really should be included in that list or not. But let's just leave it with Aquinas and Augustine. There is, uh, the church regards them as, as extraordinary teachers of the faith and in harmony with one another. Now, you will get arguments between a Thomist and an Augustinian about various points in theology, right? Um, so, uh, the church certainly regards this as a permissible uh, theological diversity. But in holding them up to such a height, it's kind of saying that not every proposed theological school should be seen as on that level. If you want to say that 
for example, the theology of St. Ambrose is, uh, or, or um, yeah, St. Ambrose uh, or Alcuin is of extraordinary value. I think you, what you would want to say is that we should, we should try to examine how that can contribute to what we already know in the very full theology of Aquinas and Augustine. Right? So can there be uh, multiple theologies? Yes. Uh, the effort should be as much as possible to see them in light of each other, to see the ways they enrich each other. I don't think there's any problem in, in, uh, in comparing them. Uh, and not every theological school can even um, make a claim to climbing to that height. Another question uh, from YouTube. This is from Rory. He says, some modern philosophers are opposed to Christianity and biblical teaching. Is it possible to integrate theological truth, the truths of the personal God, and those who think they have overcome him, like the enlightened idea of waking up from the sleep of faith, or Hegel's claim that religion is merely a step to the greater knowledge of philosophy, absolute knowing? Um, so can we synthesize Christianity and, and modern philosophy? There have been profound attempts to do this. Um, I mentioned efforts in the 19th century. Now, these didn't necessarily receive a real favorable hearing on the part of the church. When I'm thinking about uh, Georg Hermes and his attempt to think through uh, philosophy in a Kantian way, but as a faithful Catholic. Um, that would be one example. Um, or Anton Gunther trying to do the same thing with, with Hegel. Um, both of these, there were as significant aspects of those, both these attempts that were condemned by the church. So it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's necessarily a, a, a profitable way to go. But there have since been very, very interesting uh, Christian Catholic thinkers who are really trying to use um, Kant or Hegel. Um, my own uh, um, uh, uh, theological advisor when I got my master's degree, uh, Cyril O'Regan, teaches now at the University of Notre Dame, has done a tremendous amount of work on you know, uh, a Christian understanding uh, related to Hegel. Okay? So I, I am not going to dismiss such efforts. Uh, I can't myself, I don't have the, the knowledge to speak very incisively about what can and cannot be done. Uh, there are things about the Enlightenment move in theology that make it very, in philosophy, that make it very difficult to, um, uh, to think through the faith with that tool. Right? But um, there are interesting ways of trying to do that. I hope that's not punting the question. But <laughs> All right. I think we have one, uh, time for... Uh, one more question. Um, is there a sense in which philosophy judges all human knowledge and the other special sciences, such as biology, chemistry, political science, psychology? Does philosophy have the same, sorry, does philosophy have the power to judge in a way that's similar to theology? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yes and no. Um, and I'll actually read a section of the paper that I left out in the interest of time, but it addresses precisely this point. Uh, because Aquinas himself make a kind of comparison with what Sacro Doctrina does and what metaphysics does. And the, com the grounds for the comparison are, are interesting. Uh, metaphysics is a speculative science. It does not subalternate any other science, but it's higher than any other philosophical science. Um, there are a variety of texts in Aquinas that talk about the relationship of metaphysics and other sciences. Metaphysics is said to explain the principles of natural science, or the common notions used by all sciences, or it declares the truth of first principles, it bestows principles in other sciences, and judges those sciences in light of their ultimate first principles. Um, I would summarize Aquinas' teaching on this point as follows. I apologize, I'm simply reading here because um, I like the way I put this. Demonstration takes place by way of both proper principles and common notions. And since metaphysics is the most universal of the sciences, it can certainly be regarded as the source of the common notions that the sciences use, though not of their proper principles. And since metaphysics considers these things most directly and manifests them most clearly, 
One could say that the metaphysics exercises a regulative role over the other sciences. So metaphysics is in its own right a science, which is to say it gives a reasoned explanation for the thing, the truths that it holds, such as the principles of identity and non-contradiction, the notion of causality, and so on. This is similar to what a Sagra Doctrina does. So what they both do in that way is they manifest, at being at this, this, this higher science, they manifest the truth that's contained in the lower sciences. Aquinas specifically says that metaphysics does this with respect to other philosophical disciplines. I think it's helpful to see that Sacra Doctrina can be said to do the same thing about other lower sciences. Take the example I use of psychology. Sacra Doctrina knows uh, the humanity of Christ and, and the, the passions of the soul of Christ and so on, and that manifests, that in, you know, illuminates the particular thing that psychology wants to talk about, which is the human psyche. Okay? You don't prove anything about the human psyche from Sacra Doctrina, but what you are looking at is more manifest, more illuminated in Sacra Doctrina. Very similar with what metaphysics does with respect to uh, other sciences, philosophical sciences.